Thank you for watching the November edition of Forage Focus. Today's guest is Dan Lima, the Extension Educator for Belmont County in the field of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Today we'll be talking about forage considerations around pipelines. Stay tuned. Thanks again for tuning in for Forage Focus. I'm here with Dan Lima, the educator for Belmont County for Agriculture and Natural Resources. Dan, thanks for joining us on the show today. Tell us a bit about what you do in Belmont County. All right, so as you said, I am the Ag Educator in Belmont County. I've been there for about maybe five years now. Um, my focus over there is a lot of uh, forage, um, forages, livestock, and of course, Belmont County and being in Eastern Ohio and almost some would consider a mecca of oil and gas development, um, I have a oil and gas energy type focus as well that does revolve around land usage, um, which fits right into uh, the topic for pipelines. Right, and it fits in great with the location that we're broadcasting from today, which is the Eastern Agricultural Research Station in Bell Valley, Ohio. We actually have a pipeline that has run through the farm right here on location and uh, they are currently farming around that pipeline. And that's the situation that a lot of folks in our area are currently dealing with, right? That's right, that's right. Um, currently, we have millions of miles of pipeline just being laid down all over the country. Um, how many miles? How many miles? Um, a few million, I think about 2.6 million. That's a lot. That's, and I'm, yeah, that is a lot of pipelines. And pipelines, it's not necessarily something new, but with the, uh, again, with the, the growth of uh, ag oil and oil and gas and the need for pipelines, whether it's replacing old lines or just having new infrastructure that we need, um, pipelines have grown a lot and uh, it's kind of becoming a new thing that people are having to deal with, whereas maybe something that was dealt with with great-grandparents or grandparents. So new and kind of uh, something that's been around for a while. But, um. One of the things that comes to mind for me right away and for a lot of our clientele is how to farm safely around those pipelines. Mm -hmm. Clearly there's hazards associated with them. So what are the major safety concerns and how do we approach that? Right, and pipelines and agricultural land, obviously it's easier to put a pipeline in through agricultural land because you have less to deal with in terms of infrastructure that's already there, such as roads and buildings and things like that. Um, so land, agricultural land is, um, in a way, a prime way to put in those pipelines and develop that infrastructure for oil and gas or for the movement or whatever, whatever it is you want across the land. Um, and obviously with farming, there's a lot that we have to, to deal with um, to make sure that we are taking into account the pipeline that's already underground. Uh, one of those things is putting fences. You know, we did talk about forages and livestock, and those putting in a fence post across maybe tens, tens, of, tens hundreds of miles possibly, uh, depending on how big your, uh, your farm is, um, the, the fence is a necessary thing to have with livestock. So, Drilling in those fence posts, if you don't know where your pipelines are, you can potentially hit it. And you're talking about pipelines that have very high pressures of natural gas or just in, we don't know what kind of gas is in there, uh, could be very explosive. So what are some of the things that are transferred through pipelines? Uh, being in the region that we are, a lot of our folks are familiar, but we do have quite a few who watch the show that aren't in Southeast Ohio. So what's the significance, first off, of the pipelines what do they do for us as Americans? Well, um, so pipelines are used really to, to move gas. Um, and that gas, typically people say natural gas. When we talk about natural gas, we're talking about methane. 
Methane is a one carbon gas that uh, is very prevalent, especially in eastern Ohio, uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, the Marcellus Shale, the Utica. So those things have a lot of methane. Um, and of course, when we talk about energy production, methane is the, is out of, uh, out of all the gases, methane is the one that would burn hottest and cleanest, so it's kind of the prime one for energy production. So um, besides methane, we also have ethanes and propanes, and those are more industrial type uh, gases that are used in, in the industry, such as plastics, and also for energy as well. But you can kind of divide gases in energy production or industrial production. Okay. Precursors to just about every plastic that we use. Uh, as extension educators, um, we don't just owe it to our communities to cover these topics because it's important to them, but also because um, it's important in general for society whether it's farming safely or ensuring that the products we need make it from point A to point B. Um, and there is an alliance called the Pipeline Ag Safety Alliance that partners with the National Association of County Agricultural Agents, which we are members of, and they work together to promote educational programming that focuses on safe operation around pipelines. And uh, some of the slides that we have to share with you today come from the Pipeline Ag Safety Alliance. And uh, let's move into some of those looking at ways that we can promote damage prevention. Yeah, so obviously when we talk about doing things around the farm, and one of the examples that we did use was building a fence, uh, some of the ways that you can prevent a mishap from happening is to make sure that people are aware of the situation. So communication is going to be one of the most important steps in figuring out that uh, you might need to take a little extra caution, maybe do a certain activity around an area as opposed to going through it. Because let's face it, uh, when we plan these big projects, we've been planning them for a while. So it's not something that typically needs to be done in an emergency situation. So communication. And the best way to figure out where the pipelines are because we can't see them is to call um, to call somebody that is obviously going to be an expert in this. In this case, eight one one, and you just dial eight one one, right? Yes. Dial eight one one, and uh, in a few days, typically, um, there there's different uh, the time frame varies a little bit, but within a week, I want to say you're gonna. They're going to be in your property, they're going to mark all the lines, and um, if there's nothing there, you will get notified that they were there, because if there's nothing to mark, right, <laughs> there's nothing to mark. But if there is, um, you know, you'll see the flags, and you'll see, um, or the flags are typically they spray paint mm -hmm. to mark the, the gas lines there, but you'll have some notification saying that they did visit your farm or your area of interest, and uh, you either have pipelines in a specific area or not at all. But A11 is the number. And is that just recommended? Um, it's it's one of those things where um, it's... The answer is no. Right. If, it's the law, right? Right, because because if there is a mishap, right, it's, it's, a, it's on you. Right, and if there isn't a mishap, well, you know, you're gambling with something that really you don't need to be gambling for your right. life, the cost of repair. So yeah, um, in terms of, do you want to take it upon yourself to maybe pay these bills, uh, hurt yourself, hurt your family? Nobody wants that. Certainly not. So we encourage everybody, know what's below and call before you dig. So even when you've done the required job of calling 811 and having things marked, there is still a risk that you could encounter something and if you do, the first thing to do is get to a safe place and call for help. And that would be to first off call your local fire department. If you know who's responsible for that utility line, call them as well. Um, and that should start the chain reaction of getting everyone notified that needs to be aware of the disturbance. But I believe it's 99% of the time those situations are avoided by calling 811. Absolutely. So when we think about what requires a call to 811, they use the term excavation. So what types of activities 
on the farm would be considered excavation versus just typical farming? Well, let's see. Fence building was something that we've talked about that we see a lot of. Um, drainage tiling installation, even fixing drainage tile that's already down there because uh, just because there's a drainage tile down there doesn't mean that pipelines aren't going through there. Usually the pipelines will go below the drainage tile so if you're doing any kinds of repairs well the potential is there for you to hit something. Um, terracing, grading, contouring, ripping, deep tillage. If you're trying to remove a tree, you know, increase your pasture fields. You know, one of those roots could possibly nick a pipeline. Um, soil sampling. Uh, Usually not in our area, but in some areas, if they're yeah. going below 12 inches, Absolutely. Like, that could say, definitely be a concern. And if you're doing some kind of leach field, mm -hmm. you know, or um, construction project. So soil sampling can go deep. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be topsoil. They can go pretty deep if uh, depending on the job. Some other things would be like making a ditch. Ditch clearing, ditch, ditch cleaning, right trenching or um, if you just have an auger that you're putting something in the ground. In general, if the activity involves digging deeper than 12 inches, consider it excavation. Yeah, and that's not very deep at all. I mean, if you, maybe in Eastern Ohio, we don't have 12 inches of topsoil, but you know, <laughs> in other places of Ohio, they do. <laughs> they do, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> well, in our case, in Southeast Ohio, uh, we have a photo to show you that shows kind of our general overall picture of what happens in an oil and gas situation where there's a well pad and an easement right. and uh, what does that landscape look like? Exactly, yeah. People talk about oil and gas development and I always love to show this picture, the overall picture of what development looks like in terms of horizontal gas production. You have your well pad and in that well pad that might constitute five acres, maybe a little bit more. Um, usually about that. It's going to have several wellheads on it. You're going to have easements, so you're going to have pipelines, collection lines that are coming from the wellheads out to, out away from, from the pipeline, it's, or from the well pad itself. Um, you're going to have access roads going in and out of it. So there's just, there's a lot going on um, when we talk about development and things to consider. So if you are being approached, you know, a lot, most of the people listening are probably like, oh, you're five years too late. <laughs> but um, when, if, if you do get approached um, in terms of gas development, because I'm sure it's an expanding industry, mm -hmm. um, you know, think about all these things in, in development and um, think about how all these things are going to affect your farming. And the pipeline company's priorities are probably not the same as yours Absolutely. as a landowner. So what are their top priorities? After the land's been disturbed and they're trying to put things back, what's their main concern? So specifically, if we're talking about easements, so we're talking about the pipelines going through and in the area that you cannot build on, um, you can typically you can farm on them depending on your, your lease agreement. Uh, typically you can farm on it, but you can't build on it, and um, you obviously probably can't put any fence post down because you can't interrupt the pipeline and we just talked about the dangers with that. Um, I'm not saying you can't do some kind of temporary fencing or some way to utilize livestock around it, but um, you definitely can't drill into something like that. So in that right of way, which they're going to ex excavate out, um, there is general guidelines according to the Hard Department of Natural Resources where they will move the topsoil, they will move the subsoil to the other side and they will ideally put that pipeline about five feet into the ground. Um, cover it with subsoil and then the topsoil on top. But what you have there is anywhere from a 50 to 100 foot width right away, that's bare. And it could stretch, you know, you could have a little tip of it going through your farm. It could go right down the middle. It could take up most of your farm. I mean, if you think about it, 100 by whatever, could constitute acres of land. So what do you do with that bare ground? Right. I mean, obviously you don't want that all to erode away, so there needs to be some yes. considerations taken in. Right, so your concerns and the, um, the, the pipeline company's concerns are going to be different. Pipeline concerns, what 
Christine was alluding to earlier, was they're going to be worried about erosion because they're going to be, you know, the EPA is going to be there. They're going to be watching. And they're going to be worried about the timeline. So they need to get this stuff done, right? And, you know, do they always install pipelines during the prime growing season? Well, they, they can get it done when they can get it done. And usually everything's, everything's a rush job. Which leads to a lot of stand failures, right? When it comes Absolutely. to racing. Absolutely. Now, what are your concerns? You know, you as a farmer, Christine, what would you think about? I want a stand of forage that's going to withstand animal traffic and grazing. Okay. So hopefully, I have enough forage cover on that easement that I can move animals in, they can graze, I can move them out, and there's still going to be forage left over. Right. So, so the, the crop that's going in, right, the weeds, compaction issues, you know, like I said, if they need to get in and out of it and the ground's wet, you think those, uh, you think those pipelines are lifted through some light machinery? <laughs> Take some heavy machinery, which can cause compaction. Um, we, you know, we talk about topsoil and subsoil. Do those ever get mixed? Yeah, they can. <laughs> They can get mixed. Um, could you lose soil in the process? Yes. Um, you know, so land usage is is really the way you should think about land usage and the timing are probably one of the two most important things to think about. Another thing to understand is that these companies don't want to spend a lot of time fixing things, redoing things. So chances are they're going to do it once. They're going to get that stamp of approval from the state. And then you might not see them again. So. But what if they did a not as good job as what you'd hoped? That's not uncommon. Um, and that can happen. So, it, you know, you're just really going to have to be there and make sure things are happening correctly. And, um, you know, you're the farmer. A lot of these guys aren't farmers, so they don't understand. They think seed goes down and things just grow. And that's not quite how it works. Ideally, yes, but this isn't an ideal world. That's very true. Uh, and one of the biggest reasons that stands tend to fail is just poor seeding from the get-go. Right. Uh, depending on what you choose to put in your mix, which you can specify in your lease agreement at the very beginning, you might have better results and you might have worse results. Right. Um, so some concerns that we're talking about, compaction, um, if you had really bad compaction, you're not going to get good drainage, you're not going to get things to grow correctly, um, it just might make your reseeding a failure. What happens when seedings fail? Stuff still and, goes there, right? Oh. Is it the stuff you want? You know, if there, if there is topsoil, yes, if there isn't, maybe even you're just going to get a lot of erosion. Um, so, you know, it, yeah, there, there could be worse than just a whole bunch of weeds. <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking about how that machinery moves from one farm to another farm to another place. Oh, right, you right. You might have stuff come on your farm you've never seen before. That's right. So keeping an eye on what's there and what's supposed to be there uh, will be important to so, the rest of your farm. Absolutely. And so what's the best way to make sure that you're going to have something successful is timing. What time of year is it? You might not want, um, or you might, I should say, you might want warm season grasses, but it might not be the best time to put them down. And in fact, Christine, you're, you're an expert on warm season grass. The, the perennial warm season grasses. I are they easy to establish? Them. They are not easy to establish. <laughs> is that something good in disturbed ground? <laughs> not particularly. I mean, you got to disturb ground to get it established in the first place, but those perennial warm season grasses typically take about three years to get established really well and that takes some detailed management at first. After that they're pretty easy but at the beginning you've got to be careful about weed control um, and primarily moisture concerns as well and then the growing temperature has to be right. So if it's right. April and they're trying to seed those they won't work. you got to wait till it's warmer. That's so the let's case say, with a lot of things. And, and yeah and if it's April and you want cool season perennial grasses you're in good shape, you know, soil's already warming up, 
Um, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. Just right. <laughs> so what do you see in uh, February? Right. Yeah. Well, if you're the pipeline company and you've got bare soil and you have to prevent erosion, what are you going to do? You have to cover the soil with something. Yeah. And I'll tell you one thing. What's the one thing that we all have around here that grows like crazy? Kind of your solid, cool season grass. Tall fescue. Tall fescue. Um, in fact, Kentucky 31 tall fescue, mo more than likely. Something cheap, something reliable. Um, and it does so because it has a an endophyte, so it has a companion fungus that does allow it to grow in harsher conditions than most. Also allows it to compete really well with weeds and other grasses. So, um, the downside to Kentucky 31 is that it does produce a toxic end. The the endophyte produces a toxin, an alkaloid that does uh, that does cause a decrease in weight gain in livestock animals, uh, possible abortions um, of, uh, of calves and horses and whatever, whatever livestock you have. Um, so it's not the friendliest grass to have around. But what are, what are the concerns of the pipeline company? Erosion control. So Soil cover. And you know what? That does the job. And that's not all bad if you're a producer. No, it's because not. Because most likely your animals aren't spending the entirety of the growing season on your pipeline easement. They're going to move in and move out. So you can uh, alter the concentration of tall fescue in their diets for that. Um, so if, there's, if nothing else will grow there, grow tall fescue by all means. But yeah. just be cautious about how you manage for it. And let, yeah, let's say it's an area of your farm that you're not really concerned with, and that's why you negotiated the pipeline to go there. And all you want is some grass cover. You know, it's not a bad choice. It just might not be the choice, the prime choice for land usage. Now, another example. Um, let's talk about if the if the uh, pipeline was coming through in July. July tends to be pretty hot in our part of Ohio. It does. Which can be a challenge for our cool season perennial grasses, right? Absolutely. Does that mean there's nothing that we can seed in July? Yeah, and let's remember, these guys want to make sure they want to come through once. They're more than likely not going to come back. And in July, you're probably not going to put your cool season grasses down. Where I wouldn't you recommend it. Well, you just said your warm season perennial grasses are really hard to grow, you know, just as a one-time seeding, right? Yeah, but we do have some warm season annual options, which of course is going to mean that as a producer, you're going to have to come in and do something again next year. Pipeline company is probably not coming back, and if you seed an annual, it's probably not coming back either. So there's some follow-up work to go along with that. Right. But it actually could be better for you in the long run to choose a short-term solution with the pipeline company and follow up with a better option when the conditions are right. Right, and that's called mitigating your losses. <laughs> because it's not always a win-win. So if you have the choice of creating a mixture that's ideal, and you happen to get good timing to seed it, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you'd recommend producers pursue? Well, um, a lot of times you want maybe 10 to 20% of an annual type grass, something that grows quickly, uh, whether we're talking annual rye. Winter rye does well when it starts to get cold, so October, November. Um, and like February possibly, you know, when the ground's still really cold. Mm -hmm. uh, for a summer situation, uh, teff does really well. You can graze it, it grows, it'll winter kill. And I know you, I don't know how much you love teff. <laughs> I do love teff. And, and obviously, you know, mix it in with something that you do like. Um, it, it just and it it all depends on how much management that you want going into it, um, but always having some kind of annual to get a quick growth, quick cover is going to be ideal just to hold that soil in place and make sure that your perennial cool season grasses have a chance to catch up. And I'm just assuming that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, uh, so the the main concern for perennial grass in the first year is that above ground growth or below ground growth. Um, so for perennial grasses, the so for the first year, you want to make sure that the plant gets established. So you want to make sure that you're not damp. So you're going to have the root, the root growth, and the uh, leaf growth are going to 
essentially mirror each other. So if you're not letting the roots grow, catch up to the leaf growth, the, the source of all the sugars that are going feeding in and down to the roots, um, you're not going to get good establishment. So you have to make sure that you go easy on that. Don't graze it the first year. Yeah, and that can be tempting when the grass looks really nice. You want to put the animals yeah. out on there. And, and they're going to love it too. <laughs> and then it just doesn't come back very well. So resist the temptation yeah. to graze too early. And those legumes are a great companion um, crop to put in with, uh, with the grasses. They're not going to hold that soil as much as the grasses do, but they are going to be able to fix that nitrogen and allow the grass to do well, um, especially in a situation where you might not be able to get in there right away or, um, you know, if the ground's uh, really wet or, yeah, just uh, the conditions aren't ideal. Another benefit of, of legumes, particularly cool, cool season legumes, is that you can frost seed them. So if you had a situation where your seeding didn't take, you could go in and try to interseed some legumes while the freeze and thaw cycle is still happening in early right. spring yeah. and help mitigate your losses. Right, and um, you know, it, it, it might take some work, but um, your right away could be very useful, could be productive, as long as you understand what the best thing to do is understand the usage of your land, the types of grasses you have available, and you might have to do some follow-up to make sure that uh, the companies are doing what they say they're doing. Unfortunately, not everybody's honest. I'm not saying not all the companies aren't, but it's always good to make sure that at the moment that they're spreading that seed into the ground, you're there to see what they're doing because that's probably the best time to fix it. Right. And we're not implying that our pipeline folks are bad people. <laughs> we're just implying that their priorities are different than yours as a right. farmer. So yeah. make sure that yours are being considered as well. And they might, with the Kentucky 31 example, you know, they might think you're, they're doing you a favor because they've seen that grass do really well. Right. But, but if you're, if you have pregnant mares on a horse farm and your only option to graze is Kentucky 31, you could be in a really bad situation. So it's, it's definitely worth the conversation and it's also definitely worth consulting your attorney before you get into a lease agreement in case things do go sour. There's um, some other recommendations that we have from OSU Extension that are available in fact sheets and just by calling the Extension office that folks can get a hold of you. What would be our general take home thoughts for people when you're thinking about pipeline management in relation to forage production? So in, in terms of forage production, just remember land usage is a, the one thing that is really important. Just some notes from Eastern Ohio, kind of where we are. Um, perennial ryegrass doesn't do all that great. It's more in the southern part of the state. Um, it is very droughty and um, is poor. it's a poor yielder in the summer. So if you're going with those novel type grasses, we you know what I was talking about Things that we see a lot like the fescue and the orchard grass, there are really there are new varieties that you can ask for that will do that you'll really enjoy um, and that may yield more, that might be more animal friendly. Um, and if you're dealing with a situation in the summertime, that those summer annuals really do well. Um, you know, Teff is a good one. I know you said it doesn't graze well, but you know you'll get good cover on it and. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a nice grass to have. So even if you do bale hay, you'll have something good. Okay, so if folks have more question in, questions in relation to this topic, um, you can contact your local extension office. You can also contact Dan directly. His email is displayed on the slide. Um, thank you for coming and spending some time with us today to discuss this important topic. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. We'll see you next time on the next episode of Forage Focus.